Hello, my name is Ram and welcome to another video of Matuklasan. In this video, we'll talk about data organization in statistics. Random numbers like this from a survey are almost nonsense unless we use statistics in interpreting their meaning. After you define your variables and collect your data, you organize your data to help you prepare for the later steps of visualizing and analyzing your data. The techniques you use to organize your data depend on the type of variable associated with your data. For organizing categorical data, we can use either the summary table or the contingency table. A summary table presents tallied responses as frequencies or percentages for each category. For example, a survey was taken in statistics class and they were asked about their preferred gaming consoles. By tallying the response for each gaming console and organizing them on a table, we have now the summary table for preferred gaming consoles of statistics students. A summary table helps you see the differences among the categories by displaying the frequency amount or percentage of items in a set of categories in a separate column. It's also important to write proper titles and column labels. In this example, we can see that 42% or many of the students prefer the Nintendo Switch as a gaming console. A summary table helps you see the differences among the categories by displaying the frequency. But what if we need to study patterns that may exist between the responses of two or more categorical variables? We can use the contingency table. Example, a sample of 600 moviegoers was selected in a large mall to determine their favorite movie genre. Now, since the gender was considered in the profile, we will use the contingency table. And here's the contingency table for the given. This type of table cross-tabulates or tallies jointly the responses of the categorical variables. In this example, it's the movie genre and the gender. So if you want to know how many female like thriller, you can refer to this cell, which is the intersection of the thriller row and the female column. There is also an alternative version of the contingency table wherein the percentage is used instead of the frequency. And of course, it depends upon what you need in the study. How about when we have a set of numerical data? We organize them by creating ordered rays or distributions. As usual, the amount of data you have and what you seek to discover about your variables influences which methods you choose. We can organize data using stacked and unstacked data, ordered array, frequency distribution, the relative frequency distribution, the percentage distribution, and the commutative distribution. Unstocked and stock are terms used to describe two different presentations for tabular data. If you are arranging your data in a worksheet before a statistical analysis, you can choose between the two of them. Unstocked data, or sometimes called wide, is presented with each different data variable in a separate column, while stock data, or narrow, is presented with one column containing all the values and another column listing the context of the value. For example, Chef Zach wants to create a healthy menu for his customers in the restaurant he owns. He decided to survey 10 regular customers and asked about their age and weight. And this is how it will look like if you used unstocked data. Notice here that the variables are separated with columns and the values are always beneath these variables. And this is how it will look like if you use stock data. Notice that there is always a column for the variable and value. You can always rearrange these variables depending on the type of presentation you'd like to show. Stock data are usually used for raw graphs, while most of the statistical softwares like SPSS and Minitab prefers the unstock format. An ordered array arranges the values of a numerical variable in rank order from the smallest value to the largest value. 
An ordered array helps you get a better sense of the range of values in your data and is particularly useful when you have more than a few values. For example, a financial analyst collected a data about the cost of meals at 40 restaurants in City A and 40 restaurants in City B. This is the raw data for the example. And this is the ordered array version of the same data. This type of organization enables us to quickly see that the cost of a meal at City A is between 69 and 237 pesos, and the cost of meal at City B is between 66 and 204 pesos. When you have a data set that contains a large number of values, reaching conclusions from an ordered array can be difficult, right? For such data sets, creating a frequency or percentage distribution and a cumulative percentage distribution would be a better choice. A frequency distribution summarizes numerical values by tallying them into a set of numerically ordered classes. Classes are groups that represent a range of values called a class interval. We also need to study some of the important parts of frequency distribution, but I think it would be easier if I'll just show it to you, right? Let's take a look at this example. Suppose a statistics student, yeah, wala yung S dito, listed the ages of the top 50 wealthiest people in the world from the Forbes magazine. When the data are in original form, they are called raw data and are listed on the left. Since little information can be obtained from looking at the raw data, the student now organizes this data into what is called a frequency distribution. The frequency distribution consists of classes and their corresponding frequencies. Each raw data value is placed into a quantitative category called classes. The frequency of classes then is the number of data values contained in a specific class. In this example, 35 to 41 is called a class. And the set of intervals here is called classes. If we want to know the number of wealthiest people between the ages of 42 and 48, the answer is 3. Here's the more complicated version of the frequency distribution wherein we added what we call class boundaries and midpoint or class mark. This column is called the class limit or class interval column. But of course, if we want to give some details about the data, we need to write the variable that is used. And here, the values here on the left side of each interval like 35, 42, 49, up to 84 are called lower class limits while the values on the right side of the interval are called upper class limits the class width is the difference between two consecutive lower class limit or upper class limit so in this case I just need to subtract 42 and 35, and the class width is 7. You can do this in any combination of lower and upper class limits. Halimbawa ito, get the difference of this one, it should be 7. 84 minus 77 is also 7. The class boundaries are used to separate the classes so that there are no gaps in the frequency distribution, especially when we have continuous variable like H. So if we got a value of 41.23, it won't be difficult for the placement of this number or tally because we have class boundaries for 41.23. The class boundaries are used to separate the classes so that there are no gaps in the frequency distribution especially when we have continuous variable like age in this case. So, if we got 41.23, saan natin siya ipupuesto? Dito ba sa 35 to 41 o dito sa 42 to 48? Well, if you have class boundaries, 
it's not difficult because we will have a placement for 41.23 by using this interval. The values 34.5, 41.5 down to 83.5 are called lower class boundaries. The values 41.5, 48.5 down to 90.5 are called upper class boundaries. We can get the value of the lower class boundary by subtracting 0 0.5 from the lower limit 35. So 35 minus 0 0.5, the answer is 34.5. If you want to get the upper class boundary 41.5, all you need to do is to add 0 0.5 to the upper class limit 41. So 41 plus 0 0.5 is 41.5. So simple lang, di ba? Minusan mo lang lahat yung lower class limit ng 0.5, makukuha mo yung lower class boundary. Mag-add ka lang ng 0.5 sa mga upper class limit mo, makukuha mo yung mga upper class boundaries. In this column, we have midpoint or sometimes called class mark. The class midpoint is obtained by adding the lower and upper class boundaries divided by 2. So, to get 38, all you need to do is to add 34.5, 41.5, and divide it by 2. You can also use 35 and 41. So, 35 plus 41 divided by 2, the answer is 38. 70 plus 76 divided by 2, the answer is 73. The midpoint is the numeric location of the center of the class, and midpoints are necessary for graphing. Well, if you are curious or you're still confused, don't worry. There will be a separate video about the construction of frequency distribution. If you're planning to construct a frequency distribution, here are some of the things that we need to remember. First, there should be between 5 to 20 classes. It will always be your prerogative as a researcher. Pero sana, pag gagawa kayo ng frequency distribution, yung number of rows nyo, hindi dapat sobrang konti at hindi rin sobrang dami. So, depende dun sa page ng presentation ninyo kung kakasya ba o hindi, readable ba o hindi. The class width should be an odd number for us to prevent having a decimal class midpoint or class mark. Third, the classes must be mutually exclusive. So, wala dapat nag-overlap na mga intervals. So, kagaya dun sa example natin kanina, hindi pwedeng 41 ito, tapos 41 din itong kabila, or 38 or 39. Dapat walang nag-overlap sa mga to. Kaya, merong tamang paraan sa pag-construct ng mga class limits or intervals. Next, the classes must be continuous. In the previous example, Hindi pwedeng 41, tapos yung susunod dito ay 44 o kaya 45. So, kung mapapansin nyo, it's, they are always consecutive. 41, 42, 48, 49, 55, 56. Next, the classes must be exhaustive. So, sa frequency column ninyo, wala dapat magzi-zero or else magiging nonsense yung paglagay nyo dun sa class limit na katapat nung zero. So, dapat, kapag ka nagkaroon kayo ng zero na frequency, baka mali yung pagpili nyo ng number of classes. And, of course, the last one, the class must be equal in width. Aside from frequency distribution, we could also construct relative frequency and percentage distribution. So, here, the proportion or relative frequency in each group is equal to the number of values in each class divided by the total number of values, while the percentage is the proportion multiplied by 100%. Let us use the previous example. To get the proportion of the first class, which is 0.06, all we need to do is to divide 3 with the total number of frequency, which is 50. Dividing 3 and 50 will give us 0.06. If you want to get the proportion of this class, all you need to do is to divide 10 with 50 to get 0 0.2. And to get the percentage, all you need to do is to multiply the proportion to 100%. And you will have this values. 
The last type of distribution is the cumulative distribution. The cumulative percentage distribution provides a way of presenting information about the percentage of values that are less than a specific amount. Let us use the previous example and get the cumulative percentage column. For this, we will need the percentage column. And to get the values of this, all we need to do is to look at the first value in this percentage column. The first value here is 6. So we need to start with 6 here. To get the value of 12, all we need to do is to add 6 here and the 6 in this column to get 12. To get 20, all we need to do is add 12 and 8. And to get 40, all we need to do is to add 20 here and the 20 in this column. And so on. Diagonal lang yung pattern natin. And the value for the last one should be the total percentage, which is 100. But what's the importance of using cumulative percentage in the distribution? If I will ask you about the percentage of the wealthiest people under 55 years old, the answer is not 8%. Why? Because when I say under 55 years old, this also includes the intervals 42 to 48 and 35 to 41. So therefore, the answer is the cumulative percentage which is 20%, meaning 20% of the wealthiest people are under the age of 55. We also have what we call cumulative frequency, wherein instead of using percentage, we use the frequency for the column. There are also other variations of cumulative percentage and frequency. Sometimes, instead of using 3, they start with 0 to show the values or percentage below 35. And sometimes, instead of starting with 3, we could start with 10 at the bottom. Depending on your objectives, you can show all the possible distributions in one table like this. That's all for this video. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and hitting that notification bell for more updates. Thank you for listening.